How's everybody doing? Good. Good, good. Well, I'll give you a second to take your seats. Uh, I'm excited to be here with you. Have y'all been having a good time so far? Good. Well, what I want to do is, uh, you're going to see a good bit of me, so I, I, um, I want to just go ahead and pray, and we're going to get into God's Word uh, and see what the Lord has to say to us. Father, we come before you in Jesus' name. God, I thank you so much for every single person in this room. These are students, students who you created in your image, who you love. Father, you know every hair on their head. You know everything that's going on in their lives, and they belong to you. Uh, Father, we, we pray that um, you would help all of us to have a sense of how much we belong to you. We're yours, God. Uh, this world is yours. So, Father, help us to, to see that really clearly. And in this time where we hear from your word, we pray you'd speak to us clearly. God, I know I'm not wise enough, smart enough to change anybody's life, but your word is more, um, yeah, it's more than, than strong enough and wise enough. So, Father, we pray you would do that, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, well, yeah, my name is, is Tripp. Uh, very excited to get to be with you for a little bit. Um, and right now, as I uh, preach God's Word, I'm going to be looking around and seeing how you respond. And that's how I'm going to decide if I'm going to even come back for the concert tonight. If anybody, if I see one yawn, if anybody looks too bored, I'm going home, all right? I'm just joking. I'm just joking. I got a contract. I have to stay. Um, <laughs> I'm excited to, to, to be here with y'all. Um, let me tell you just a very quick little bit about me. Uh, my name is Tripp. I live in Dallas, Texas. I grew up in Dallas, Texas. Did somebody just cheer for Dallas? Uh, good. I appreciate that. I appreciate it. Did someone say Luca? Uh, that's my guy. Uh, we're not friends, but we are in my mind. Uh, I grew up in Dallas, Texas. One of the interesting things about Dallas, Texas, where I grew up, is... It is not only the home of the Dallas Cowboys and the Dallas Mavericks, it is also the home of a billion churches. Not really a billion, but it feels that way. Because Dallas is just one of those places where it was just churches everywhere. It was like you could, you know, like have one foot in one mega church and high five someone standing in another one at the same time because they were just everywhere, real close to each other. And so one of the things this meant for me growing up is I... Um, Everybody I met and was around, everybody just kind of assumed everybody was Christians. It was just a thing. Everybody thought everyone was Christians to the point. But one time when I was in like sixth grade, this kid was like, I'm not even a Christian. And everybody was like, <gasps> the needle skipped. Everyone was shocked. Like, I didn't know these non-Christians were real. But here's the thing. Uh, I was confused about what it meant to be a Christian because there were some people who uh, loved Jesus and said they were Christians and some people who didn't really care that much about Jesus and said they were Christians. And there were some people who tried to live these moral lives and some people lived these immoral lives. And all of them said they were Christians. I was confused about what it actually even meant to be a Christian. Um, you know, my family would drag me to church sometimes. I would go. I didn't want to go, but I did. I didn't know, I didn't like the songs they were singing. I was like, why is the pastor screaming? Isn't a microphone meant to amplify your voice, sir? We can hear you. Um, so this one, someone said, amen. Uh, there was one time we went, and after the service, they said, hey, um, there's a youth retreat. This is when I'm like 13 years old. Now, let me tell you, before that, when I was a little kid, when I was like five, I went to church one time. The children's pastor was like, hey, Kids, after we did whatever kids do in church, color pictures of Noah's Ark, whatever it is, they was like, hey, kids, do you want to go to heaven where you'll live forever? You'll probably get to, like, ask Jesus what happened to the dinosaurs, and, you know, you get to ride on the backs of cheetahs. You could probably teleport unlimited supplies of cookies and Kool-Aid. You could play one-on-one -on -one basketball with Jesus forever. <laughs> you want to go there? Or do you want to go to hell where you'll burn forever? I was like, whoa. I was like, I like the first one, please. I was like, all right, we'll just repeat this prayer after me. So I repeated this prayer. It was like, God, God, my bad, my bad, and, you know, all of that. 
I was like, oh, if you say that you're a Christian, and I was like, oh, I guess I'm a Christian. But I didn't feel nothing, so I said it a few more times just to make sure it took. But when I look back, I don't think I was a Christian because I did not understand anything about who Jesus was, what he had done for me. I might, the words were empty, right? I might as well have just been reading the newspaper. They meant nothing to me. Um, it is very possible to repeat some words after somebody that you don't understand and that are not sincere and not really have uh, gotten a good feel for who Jesus is. So when I'm like 13, 14, I go to my, I get dragged to church and there's a sign up for a youth retreat. I'm like, mom, I am not going to that. And I looked over there and it was some cute girls in line. I was like, mom, I'm going to go to that, right? So I went <laughs> and I signed up. <laughs> Long story short, I went, I was trying to holler at girls and stuff. I did not care about Jesus, but Jesus cared about me. He was very gracious because even though I had bad motives, Jesus had good ones, had a good youth pastor. He didn't just give us fun things to do. He also opened the Bible and preached the gospel of Jesus. And as I heard that gospel of Jesus, all the stuff I hadn't understood before when I was just repeating words, like God being holy and me being a sinner and Jesus loving me so much that he put on human flesh and paid for my sins and rose from the grave and what it meant to put my faith in him, that stuff clicked. I put my faith in Jesus. And let me tell you, one of the reasons I, I say that is because it began to be the foundation that the entire rest of my life was built on, right? Because um, after I put my faith in Jesus, now I'm trying to figure out what my life is supposed to be. I was already rapping, but I was terrible, but I didn't know that. I was terrible, by the way. My rap names, around that time, Lil Will was one of them. That's not creative. It's just my name with a Lil in front. Uh, the, the next one was The Playboy, T-H-A space P-L-A-Y-B-O-I, because things are cooler if you misspell them. <laughs> Put my faith in Jesus. And even music, I'm like, what am I supposed to do now that I see the world doesn't revolve around me? And one of the reasons I say that to you is because... Um, my career as an artist and uh, or books I've written or any sermon that I've preached or any concert I've ever done, all of that for me is built on the fact that God is who he said he is, that Jesus is who he said he is, and everything in my reality is built on that. The, the, look, the, the parable that, I wanna, that we're going to look at briefly right now um, has God talking to us about what we should be building our lives on. I hope you understand there are good and bad things to build your lives on. Another thing just to know about me, I have kids. I have three kids. Um, I have a nine-year-old, a seven-year-old, and a one-and-a-half-year-old. Um, by the age gap, you can tell which one was a surprise. <laughs> um, and let me tell you, my kids are learners, and so my one-and-a-half-year-old, Silas, like he is starting to try to talk. And it's amazing to me that Kids can figure out how to talk just from watching adults and being like, okay, if I put my tongue at the roof of my mouth, I can make a d sound and say dad. And dad is his favorite word. And I've been trying to tell my wife that means I'm his favorite parent. Uh, but kids are learners. Here's the thing, all of us are learners. So at all times, even my older kids, they always ask me questions, why, why this, why, I mean, all the why questions possible. I don't watch basketball games with my son anymore because I'm like, you ruining the game for me, bro. You're asking the score just right there. It says 35 to 34. So the thing you need to learn is math, right? So um, I don't talk to him like that. That's what I say in my head, so I don't say it out loud. Now I'm just playing. We watch basketball together. But all of us are learners. And here's the thing. We are constantly getting information all the time. The question is not whether or not you're learning. The question is who you're learning from. Um, right? So people say we don't read, read that much anymore. But um, the truth is, if, if you think about how much we read, not just with books, but what we're looking at on our, on our phones and, and in our texts and on social, all day, the amount of stuff that we're taking in is crazy. It's actually more than any other generation was in terms of how much stuff. Um, some people say we read the equivalent of 30 books a day if you add up our texts and emails and stuff we read on social and all of that. And all the articles you skim, um, all of that, um, just playing, not 30 books a day. I made that up. I was just trying to see if you were paying attention. And you just went with it. Somebody tweeted it already. It's not true. But we read a lot, all day, every day. We're always listening, always learning, always trying to make sense of the world around us. But here's the thing. None of us have any idea what we're talking about most of the time. Um, 
there are good messages and bad messages. And what I want you to know is that we do not want to build our life on false things. We don't want to build our life on lies. We don't want to build our lives on half-truths. We hear messages from every direction all the time. So, so I, don't know what, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know what apps pop up on your phone the most. I don't know what websites you go to the most. I don't know who you text the most. But aren't we constantly hearing from people? Some of us, um, we don't have any moment of the day where we're not getting additional messages. Well, I, I want to read this parable, what Jesus says about his words. And I want you to think about why the words of Jesus are unique, why they're different than the words we hear uh, from other people. This is what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7, uh, verse, verse 24. Jesus says this, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice... It's like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it didn't fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash." This is God's word, and this is what Jesus says to them. Now, when you hear somebody speak like that, when you hear somebody say, anyone who listens to these words and acts like them, they're the sensible one. Anyone who doesn't act on the words I say, they're the foolish one. Now, if this was any old regular person, you would say, bro, I think maybe you need to humble yourself a little bit. Right, because most people, so somebody said to me, hey, Tripp, for the rest of your life, I need you to, anything I say, build your entire life on that. I'm always right. Even when you disagree with me, just do what I want you to do. What if, if one of y'all said that to me, I would say, no, absolutely not. I don't even know you, and I know you're not right all the time. If my wife said, hey, if you want our marriage to go well from here on out, I need you to only do what I want you to do all the time and never do what you want to do. I would say, we need to go to counseling. Why? Because my wife is also a sinful human being. She's not perfect, so there's some ways that, I mess, that I'll mess up my life, run myself off a cliff. My wife is just going to run me off of different cliffs. But when we're talking about Jesus, Jesus is not just another person with some more ideas. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is different. So, so here's another example. If I was, I don't know, like sitting in church or something, and my wife came up to me, she said, oh, hey, but um, can you give me the keys so I can get, go get some money out of the, the glove compartment? I'd be like, sure. If I was sitting in church and a complete stranger came up to me and said, hey, bro, I need you to give me the keys. What's up, babe? I need you to give me the keys um, so I can go get some money out your car. I would call the police. And say, this man just called me, babe. I don't know him. <laughs> he also tried to steal. Uh, and the reason, that matter, the, the reason I say that is because the way we receive a message depends on who we receive it from. Right? Whether or not we begin to build our lives on something has to do with the authority, the credibility of the person we're listening to. Jesus is saying, I'm not just another voice. What you do with my words says something about what will happen with your life. When we listen to stories, we, we, we're always trying to put ourselves in the stories. And this particular story, Jesus talks about a sensible man and a foolish man. He says the sensible man is the one who listens to his words and acts on them. The foolish man is the one that who doesn't. When we look at ourselves, we want to say, what does it look like for me to be the sensible person in this story and not the foolish one? Um, we know that Jesus has things to say to us, but we don't always want to listen to what Jesus has to say. Why is it that sometimes we don't um, want to read the Bible or want to hear what Jesus has to say? And I think the truth is, for a lot of us, is we just don't really think it's very useful. If we're honest, we're just like, I don't know what Jesus has to say to me that's going to change what happens in my life today or tomorrow. Um, but, but I just want you to know that um, what Jesus has to say absolutely is useful. It's the most useful, and it's the thing we should build on. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, talking about the Word of God, Paul says, All scriptures God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And the main reason um, that this book is useful, that the words of Jesus are useful, is because it is the words of God. This is God speaking. It says right after this uh, part that they, that they looked at Jesus and they were astonished because he was speaking as one with authority, not like everybody else. They were saying, 
it seems like there's something different about how he speaks. Like when prophets would show up in the Old Testament, they would say, thus says the Lord. When Jesus came, he said, I say unto you, because Jesus is the Lord. I'm just trying to drive home the point that when Jesus has something to say, it's very different than a regular person having something to say, and it is worth us building our lives on. Y'all following me? So when we're thinking about who should I be listening to, when I try to make sense of the world around me, this is one of the unique things about human beings. Like I have a dog. He's a French bulldog. We had a dog before this that um, my wife made us give to another family because he was very energetic. And so we said, okay, if we're going to have a dog, it has to be so lazy that it's basically a carcass. It has to almost be dead. <laughs> What's a breed that's basically dead? So I Googled, what's a breed that's basically dead? And Google's like, French bulldogs are basically dead. We never should have made them in a lab or whatever we did to make them. But my dog, he's very cute, looks like he ran into a brick wall, face smushed in. My kids love him. Um, his name is Jay. Um, and uh, my, my daughter enjoys him. My son enjoys him. My wife does not enjoy him. But um, he, he's, a great, he's a great dog. And, I, and I'm going to tell you something um, right now about this dog because I forgot why I even brought him up. <laughs> and I'm not even joking right now. I don't remember why I just brought up my dog. <laughs> and, you know, when I tell my wife that, she's going to laugh really hard at me. Um... <laughs> And, you know, even in this moment, I'm trying not to take this L and move on, but I have no idea where I was going. <laughs> so I'm going to take this L, and then I'm going to come back to it later. Um, oh, he's a great dog. Um, one, of the, <laughs> one of the reasons we don't go to God's Word is because we don't think it's very useful, and depending on who we hear it from, it changes uh, how we respond to it. So as Paul sits here and he says that all Scripture is God-breathed, he's saying... As sure as you can trust that these words coming out of my mouth are the words of trip, you can trust that anything you see in this book is the word of God. And sometimes we doubt God's word. Um, and one of the reasons we doubt God's word is because sometimes when we open it and we hear something Jesus said or, or something that the epistles say or something, we look at it and we say, that doesn't sound like what we think these days. It sounds a little bit different than the way we think of some uh, kinds of morality or the way that we think about how the world is made. Um, and what, the thing about us is we're always trying to make sense of the world. Now, I have a dog named Jay. Here it is. Animals. My dog is very um, unintelligent. My dog does everything based on instinct. So no matter how many times I say, Jay, don't eat that chocolate that my kid left on the ground, you're going to die. Um, what I've realized is he doesn't speak English, and he's driven purely by instinct. He sees something to eat, he tries to eat it. The only way to teach him is to give him something else I reward him for better. Human beings don't just run off instinct. We try to make sense of the world around us. We ask why questions. We make decisions based on what makes the most sense, right? And when God speaks to us, and when we begin to think about how to make the best sense of the world, who we learn from, who we listen to is going to make all the difference. Now, as we um, uh, look at the world around us and we begin to wonder if maybe God's Word um, is, is, is still uh, speaking to us, and let, let me just give you a few things that Scripture is not, that the Word of Jesus is not. Scripture is um, not just an opinion because it's God-breathed. But, so because this is God's Word, God spoke this, it's not just an opinion. It is not a book full of suggestions. It's not a book of quotes somebody gathered together. Because Scripture is God-breathed, it's not outdated. This is not an old book with old perspectives that we've moved past. God's truth does not expire. God always has been. He always will be. He is not captive to a time and place. God has never learned any new information. God has never been proven wrong. He, he's never realized that what he used to think isn't as good as what he thinks now. 
because this is God's word, um, it is not just information. So we don't go to the Bible just to get more information or to feel deep. We go there to meet with the living God. We go there to hear from the creator who spoke breath into our lungs, who said, let there be light, and there was. That's who speaks to us in this book. That's also who put on human flesh and walked the earth. So when Jesus says, build your life on my words, he's saying, the reason you can trust my words for your life is because I'm the creator of life itself. Now, don't you think that carries more weight than your friends? Don't you think that carries more weight than random stuff you see throughout the day? This is God's Word. Because this is God's Word, it's not boring. Now, we may be bored by it, but it's not boring because um, uh, the problem is we get to see God in this. So if we, if I was to look at the most beautiful painting of all time and it looks ugly to me, well, what probably needs to happen is I probably need to understand art better. And if we look in the Word of God and look at the creator of the universe, who holds the universe together by the Word of His power, who's absolutely perfect, absolutely beautiful, and we find Him boring, the problem is not with God, it's with us. We, we need our vision to be fixed. And because this is God-breathed, this Word is not weak. Like I said, God spoke everything into existence with his word. He created the universe with his word. He holds the universe together by the word of his power. So when Jesus says, my words are worth building on, it's true. Now, sometimes when we do look at God's word and something is a little bit different and it's hard, it, it, you know, I know I'm not the only person who's ever read something in Scripture and thought, I don't, I don't, that, that's different than what I've thought. Or, I, I, I know you're telling me to do this, but I don't really want to. I know you're telling me not to do that, but I want to. But let me say this. We get confused when we go to God's word and we find out God has any views that are different than ours. And that throws us off and it pushes us away from the Bible. But I want to say this. Um, there's no time that we learn that, we're, that what we currently think isn't challenged. And sometimes we say, I want to go to Scripture. Uh, I want to look to Jesus to find a God who is wiser than me, holier than me knows everything even though I don't, more powerful than me, and then we get confused when he's not exactly like us. Don't you think if there's an all-powerful, all-knowing, all-wise God that maybe he wouldn't agree with you on a few things? Why are we surprised when we find a God who's not basically just us? Here's what I want to say. When you hear something Jesus has to say, and he's saying, build your life on my words, but if you see something and you think, I don't, that's not what I think, I'm confused by that one, that's okay. Do not be afraid to admit to yourself and to others that you're struggling with something that God or that Jesus has to say. When we pretend, that's when we, um, that's when we keep ourselves from interacting with Jesus in a genuine way. I want you to know, um, I don't know everybody here personally, but I feel pretty sure that your leaders, your parents are not interested in you pretending to look like a cool Christian who knows all the who agrees with everything Jesus says. I think they're a lot more interested in you wrestling in an honest way that helps you to see the goodness of what Jesus actually has to say. And if we're always afraid to say, Jesus said that and that don't sound right to me, can you help me understand that? Then we'll never be able to wrestle and actually have a good interaction with Jesus. Does that make sense? I do not want you to create environments for yourself where you got to pretend. I want you to honestly wrestle what Jesus has to say. But he will say some stuff that you don't like because he knows more than we do, and, and he'll have to pull us along. So instead of that pushing you away, I want you to say, Jesus, help me to understand what's here. Because here's what Jesus says. He, he's saying, there's one, this sensible man builds his house on the rock, and then wind comes, and rain comes, and the river comes, and his house is firm and in place. And the foolish man builds it on the sand, and then rain comes, and the wind comes, and the river comes, and his house is washed away. Um, because what we build on matters. I had a friend who was trying to get a new floor in his kitchen, and they said, okay, they ripped up the floor. They said, mm, the subfloor also needs to be replaced. And if we build it on this, then you, it's just going to slope. So they pull up the subfloor, then they're like, mm, the whatever's underneath the subfloor also needs to be replaced. I'm a rapper. I don't know about construction. Then they said... As they kept going, they were like, we, we probably need to replace the foundation. They basically had to rebuild that whole part of his house. But here's what they were saying. We can make it look pretty, but I just want you to understand you will be building pretty stuff on something that's going to rot and fall down. So you're wasting your time. And here's, here's what I want to say. There, there are lots of um, gifts 
and desires and all kinds of things that the Lord has given you. But here's what Jesus is saying. If you build those on shaky ground and on sand, on any truth, on any reality other than the one that comes from Jesus, you're building it on sand and it will be washed away. And I know sometimes we feel like, no, I'll do this and everything will just be perfect after this. What Jesus is reminding us is storms come our way. There are winds, there are rains, there are rivers that want to wash you and everything you've built away. And Jesus is saying the way to, to be able to endure that is to build it on my word. Last thing I'll say is this. If someone is going to be bold enough to say, build your life on what I have to say, then they have to be able to give us a reason to actually trust them. Um, and it's hard to trust people sometimes especially when they're calling you to do something other than what you actually want to do. Um, like my son, when he was real little, he used to like to try to jump off the dresser like Batman and fly. He said, Dad, I want to jump off the dresser and fly like Batman. First problem, Batman don't even fly, so you got your facts wrong. <laughs> Two, your little legs can't withstand that kind of weight. You barely are standing up, much less landing safely off a dresser. Don't do that. So in the moment, I have to convince him, like, no, no, no. You just got to trust me. I know it seems great to you, but trust me. And then I have to remind him of my track record. Like, aren't I a good dad? Don't I always come through with the good special treats? Don't I always come through with the goldfish? Not even the regular ones, the flavor blasted goldfish. <laughs> with the extra cheese on that. It's like them, they are so much better. Why do they still make the old ones? Anyway, I, I have to say, you know my track record. You know I love you. You, you know my work, son. You have to trust me. And he did, and I got him off. And, and here's the thing about God. God has an incredible track record, one that is worth trusting. If somebody said to me, look, Tripp, you, if you play a, a play two-on-two basketball game, um, if you win, you get a billion dollars, pick anybody you want. I'm picking Steph Curry because I've seen his work. I've seen him make shots from his house while sleeping. That's what he does. So I want that dude on my team. I know what he does. And here's the thing about God. In this book, we see the track record of God. In this book, we see that nothing, um, uh, from nothing came everything because God spoke his word and he created it. In this book, we see God create and love. In this book, we see um, uh, God take a small nation and say, you're mine. And, and we see him defend that small nation against these much greater nations. In this book, we see God take that little nation that's nothing and put his might and his power behind it. In this book, we see God put on human flesh, even though we sinned against him put himself in human flesh. In this book, we see God live the absolute perfect life. In this book, we see God say, not only do I say I love you with my words, I show you with my actions, I'll take the death you deserve. In this book, we see Jesus not just say he's more powerful than sin, but defeat sin. We see Jesus not just say he's more powerful than the devil, but defeat the devil. We see Jesus not just say he's more powerful than death, but defeat death. Hey. Not only that, um, spoiler alert, uh, Jesus wins in the end. We see where it's going. So, so then when I begin to ask myself, has God, has Jesus shown me enough for me to say, I'm going to build my life on his word, not just mine, not just my friends, not just the people around me, but on his, I think he's done enough. There's no one whose track record is anything like his as far as credibility. Um, the good news of Jesus is not like other news. If I told you, hey, I have some news, uh, uh, you know, the next Stranger Things trailer is on YouTube. You'd be like, okay, cool. If you like that show, you'll go watch the trailer. If you don't, you move on with your life. I remember seeing the news several years ago that Pokemon Go was a big thing on iPhone. And I thought, I don't like that. That news means nothing to me. I'm moving on with my life. The good news of Jesus that the Son of God came to earth, died, and rose, that's the kind of news that demands a response from you. If someone said, here's some news, your house is burning down. Well, that's the kind of news that makes me want to spring into action because it demands an action for me. It's urgent. The good news of Jesus demands something of us. And what it demands of us is faith in Jesus, turning from our sin, and building our entire life on his words. All right. That's easier said than done. Um, and so I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're listening to God's word. But what this text is gonna tell, has told us is that it doesn't matter just that we've heard it. It matters if we act on it. Um, and so my, my prayer is that you would listen, you'd respond with faith, and you'd build on what he's had to say. I'm going to pray. 
Father, we come before you in Jesus' name. We thank you so much for your word. We thank you so much for everyone in this room. And God, we pray you would give us the courage, the foresight, the wisdom, the faith to build our entire lives on you and your word. Thank you for everyone in this room. God, I pray for my, my brothers and sisters who know Jesus already, who've seen his glory, that you'd help them to know him more. Father, and for my friends who don't know him yet, who are just curious, who are skeptical, you'd help them to see how incredible Jesus really is. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.